Hello again, I am Blunty, and while it's hardly been a secret, we have now marked the official unveiling of Intel's latest batch of consumer desktop CPUs. And rather more importantly, the non-disclosure agreements and review embargoes are up now. So, in addition to the video immediately preceding this one, where I looked at MSI's new motherboard, now I can also talk about the Intel Core i7-7700K chip that I tested with it. Intel's codenamed KB Lake desktop processor platform is Intel's seventh generation of what they call the Core series. Like with Skylake, which preceded it, it's based on the 14 nanometer process node, but with further refinements to the design. Much like how Devil's Canyon was a refresh of Haswell, KB Lake is a refinement of Skylake. And if all that sounds like gibberish to you, basically all it means is we shouldn't expect any huge leaps forward in overall performance here. It is not a brand new architecture, it is not a brand new process, it is just a refinement. There are some new features though, of course, and efficiency gains from the refined designs. It uses the same LGA1151 CPU socket that Skylake uses, and in fact the KB Lake CPUs will be backward compatible with existing 100 series motherboard platforms, but the new CPUs also bring with them a new motherboard chipset in the 200 series, like the Z270 MSI Gaming Pro Carbon I just reviewed. The new 200 series platform brings with it full support for the KB Lake CPUs in the form of things like the number of PCIe 3.0 lanes being boosted from the 20 on the 100 series chipset to 24 and 6 SATA 3.0 lanes. Alongside that, other I.O. bumps like support for 10 USB 3.0 ports. The CPU's onboard graphics now support dual 5K displays, new native HEVC 10-bit hardware video decoding with VP9 10-bit hardware decoding alongside it, and native Thunderbolt Gen 3 and into Optane technology. Again, a lot of acronyms and technical gibberish there, but basically what it all boils down to is it's around 5-10% to 10 faster than Skylake will be in most common tasks. It'll probably soak up higher overclocks because of the efficiency designs, and it has forward-looking native decoding for modern video codecs and perhaps of most practical use in avoiding bottlenecks in many tasks that rely on stuff coming from your drives, a significant boost in I.O. lanes. So yeah, as I said, MSI along with the Z270 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard review loaner, they also sent me an Intel Core i7-7700K CPU to test with it. It is the top of the line in the new series, and of course being a K-series chip, after a few initial tests to make sure everything was okay with my review sample, I dove in to see how far I could overclock it right off the bat. Now, straight out of the box, this little beastie clocks in at 4.2 GHz. A week ago I caught news that some hardcore overclockers out there have already managed to ramp one of these chips up to a bewildering 7 GHz using liquid nitrogen cooling, and this was of course with all but one of the cores on the CPU shut down, so while it's pretty cool to hear it can go up to 7 GHz, it's not what you'd call practical. Meanwhile, humble old me here, in a much more common and more importantly practical and actually day-to-day -day useful scenario, paired it with a Thermaltake Water 3.0 240 Ring RGB all-in-one cooler. It's easy. It's affordable and trusty, and by the way, as it turns out, quite a surprising performer. A little beastie, actually. I achieved a full 1 GHz overclock, taking the chip up to 5.2 GHz, even slightly above that, actually, but it wasn't stable enough for everyday use, so I wound it back to a flat 5 GHz, a nice round number and fully 800 MHz over stock, and I got rock solid stability and without having to constantly run the radiator's fans at high speed. In fact, at 5 GHz, at idle, at least in the mornings before the currently brutal Sydney summer makes the ambient temperatures obnoxious, it will sit happily at around 35 to 37 degrees. So then I kicked its head in for about an hour's worth of Prime 95 max loading, every core at every second, 100% load, overclocked to 5 GHz in the Australian summer in my tiny apartment without air conditioning, and it was still rock solid stable, and I was still barely brushing against 90 degrees, believe it or not. And by the way, this was also with the voltage maxed, so that's pretty friggin' impressive. Especially considering the comparatively humble twin fan little happy consumer all in one cooler with a small reservoir and a comparatively thin radiator. So well done Thermaltake, that's some nice engineering work right there. And well done Intel, I suppose. I had been hearing that KB Lake runs a bit warmer at stock speeds than Skylake does, but it keeps its cool better in overclocks, and that certainly seems to bear out here. 
And given that the extreme overclockers got a single core up to 7 GHz, and with a basic consumer level cooler I got my learner sample easily up to 5 GHz, I'd be willing to estimate that with a more significant cooling rig, a lot of people will be able to get this chip stable everyday overclock somewhere between, let's say, 5.2 and maybe even approaching the shadow of 6 GHz if you're lucky. I'm sure we'll see in the coming weeks as more and more of these get out into the wild. Now I also wanted to know what Intel's onboard graphics could do now, which is dumb really, because no one willing to invest in an i7-7700K for a gaming rig is likely to neglect to add a nice fat discrete GPU with it, but hey, I'm curious so I tried it. For these tests, because the silicon lottery means not everyone will get the same overclocks, I rolled back my 5GHz overclock to stock clocks of 4.2GHz for a level playing field. Esports friendly games like Smite ran quite well actually. In 1080p and in medium settings I was getting between 70 and 100 FPS, absolutely sufficient for this game. But on the other end of the spectrum I threw doom at it. <laughs> Again, ridiculous. But in 720p and at the very lowest settings it ran... well it... it... it, it ran. And it was what you might call playable. You might. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> Now again, this was just pure curiosity, by no measure am I suggesting the i7 all on its own can, should or would be considered by anyone to be a good idea to try and be a gaming rig all on its lonesome. However, if your plan is to use it in something more like a media center, the performance when it came to playing back high bitrate, high resolution media was utterly superb. Same is true when it came to encoding and converting video. Now. I'm not really painting this video to be an all-in review. Personally, I don't have enough of the Skylake chips at hand, for example, to measure against this in any useful way. There are sites and channels that can do the deep dive technical breakdown stuff better than I, with more complete and larger comparison bases. They were probably very dry and boring videos full of bar graphs and things, but you know, that's not how I roll. But starting out with the 7700K does give me, as a dude who likes to make videos based on practical everyday uses, not charts and graphs, it gives me a benchmark of my own to measure against the rest of the range, and whatever AMD is planning to unleash upon us this year too. But to get some real world perspective on what I personally use now in my main personal rig, a Skylake 6600K i5 overclocked to 4.4 GHz, against the 7700K at stock clocks, I did do some basic tests and some real world stuff, which is actually really interesting, but I'll publish that in a follow up video all on its own. For now, the conclusion to draw from the KB Lake CPUs is in fact the same as it was for Devil's Canyon. If you've been waiting to see how they perform before pulling the trigger on building a new rig, they are great, go for it. If you have been waiting to see whether it might be worthwhile upgrading from your Skylake machine, you won't find a lot of benefit for your money here, unless what you run now is an i3 or a low-end i5 or something and you want to move on to an i7 without having to upgrade your motherboard, that is a decent way to go. You won't get some of the extra bells and whistles like the extra PCIe lanes as such using it with a 100 series board, but you will get a performance boost. The CPU will work absolutely fine, it won't be restricted or slowed down or anything using it on the older boards. And you'll still get the new native video codex and the better thermal efficiency for overclocking. If you run a CPU from, let's say, three or four years back, I'd say it's worth upgrading now. The second revision of any given architecture is always the way to go for a longer term upgrade cycle. You get the benefit of stability, better overclocking, and better thermals. So, with my high watermark set for the KB Lake processors with the i7-7700K here, hopefully soon I'll start making my way through the rest of the family. And like I said, now I've got some numbers from something worthy against which to measure AMD's attempt to claw back some of the ground they've lost in recent years, if they can. Thanks for watching, I am Blunty, and I'll catch you next time.